I want to start it off like this. You don't have to raise your hand or anything, but just thinking, have you ever experienced prejudice? Where someone looked at you and they judged you based on something about you before they even got to know you. Uh, maybe it was the way you look. Maybe it was because uh, you're too young. Maybe it's because you're too old. Maybe it's because of the color of your skin or the color of your hair or the tattoos you got on your body or the clothes that you wore or the culture that you're from or whatever it is. Uh, I think all of us at some level have probably experienced some, some form of prejudice. Would you agree? Now, some probably to a greater extent than others. Now, here's the hard question. How many of you have ever done the same thing to somebody else? That hurts a little bit, right? Because I think at some level, sometimes we have a tendency to look at other people and judge them, to, to have a little bit of prejudice towards other people who are not like us, who aren't like the good people who are like me, who do this or who are like this. Would you agree? So I've been, as I was prepping this message and thinking about this, I, I was really convicted. You see, I, I have a confession I need to make today as a pastor. I'm prejudiced. I am. And some of you laugh a little bit, but it's true. I am prejudiced against Minnesota Vikings fans. <laughs> true story. True story. Pray for me. Uh, <laughs> now, if you don't know, I'm a Packer fan. I, I was born and raised a Packer fan. Yes. Uh, and I know Pastor Bill is a Vikings fan. Yeah, that's right. No cheers for him. <laughs> but pray for him, right? Uh, <laughs> and I know I joke about this a little bit because it's fun. It's fun to joke a little bit about, you know, sports teams and that kind of thing. And, you know, these little rivalries. And I look down on people who don't like the team that I like because, of course, they're not like me and the, the good people, the Packer fan people, you know. But we do this in, in all sorts of different ways to other people, sometimes in, in ways that are kind of meaningless and just kind of fun like this. In other ways, sometimes more harmful, sometimes more hurtful, sometimes very subtle and sometimes not so subtle. Sometimes we think we're subtle in it and it's really not. And we can really hurt some people. And so here's the thing is prejudice uh, is a problem we have. Uh, prejudice, what it is, if, if you think about it, it just means to prejudge, right? prejudice. You're prejudging someone. You, you are the judge, the jury, and the executioner. You look at someone and before you even have the trial, you've already declared them guilty and you've already labeled them or put them in some corner, right? You've already made the determination before you even got a chance to get to know them. And the problem is, uh, is that if we're not careful, we quickly become self-righteous, hypocritical, uh, judgmental people. And this is not honoring to God. It doesn't honor, the God, honor, honor God at all. You know, the sinful human heart has a prejudice problem. We all have sin in our hearts and it leads us to, to judge other people because they're not like good people like me who do whatever. We have fill in the blank for you. And if, if, if we're not careful, it can lead to all sorts of hurt and ugly things in our world that, that divide people and cause destruction and pain. Uh, so we've been in the series called Watershed, and we're, what we're doing is we're going through the book of Acts, the early church, the story of the early church, and talking about these watershed moments, these, these big, pivotal, dividing moments uh, that where the course of the church changed, uh, and these, these big, pivotal moments in the church. And so today we're going to be looking at a story that's very surprising of how the early church, how God worked and changed the way that they looked at these outsiders in a way that shocked everybody in the church. Uh, so if you got a Bible with you, we're going to be in Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Uh, you can look at it. There's Bibles under there, all the seats in front of you. We're going to put it up on the screens as well. Uh, and I'm going to warn you, we're going to go through the whole chapter. I know. All right. It's a big chapter. And I'm going to tell you this too. It's a true story. This is the longest narrative in the book of Acts. All right. So some of you are like, oh no, <laughs> get ready. It's coming. We're going to, we're going to be getting in the Bible a little bit. Uh, and, and this story not even goes to chapter 10. It also spills a little bit into chapter 11. We're not going to go there. And it also is repeated later on in the, in the book of Acts as well. Uh, because why? Why is that important? Because it shows that the author, Luke, who wrote the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, it's a, the Acts is a sequel to Luke. Uh, it shows that the author, Luke, saw this as important. He spilled a lot of ink over this story. Why? Because this was a pivotal turning point moment, a watershed moment in the early church. It was so important that he, he, he spent a lot of time elaborating about it. So I think it's important for us to look at it today. So if you got a Bible with you, we're going to be in Acts chapter 10. If Acts 10 were a movie, 
and be broken up into three different scenes. So imagine three different scenes in a movie, and that might help you kind of uh, break down this chapter as we're looking at it today. So if, if this were a movie, scene one is in Caesarea. So if you look at this map up here, it might be a little bit hard to see. Okay, Caesarea, is, uh, that's Israel right there. Jerusalem's in the bottom right corner, the tip of the Dead Sea. You can see the little blue over there. That's the Dead Sea. That blue line running through on the right side, that's the Jordan River. And the left, that's the Mediterranean Sea, big open sea uh, leading to the rest of the known world at that time. And Caesarea, was right up there at the top. Now, Caesarea was uh, the center of Roman power in the region at that time. It was the center of Roman power in the region. It was Roman to the core. Uh, the name kind of gives it away. It wasn't Jews' area, okay? It was Caesarea, Caesar's area. It was named after Caesar Augustus, right? This was the, the center of the Roman rule and power at the time in, in there. And uh, it was... Uh, just filled with Roman culture. I, I went there a while back and I took this photo. Here's a photo of it. There's Caesarea National Park. And you can kind of see it a little bit. Uh, that flat area right there by the beach, that uh, was their arena. That was where they did chariot races, gladiator games, where they would have slaves and people fight to the death. Right there, there's a bunch of stone like amphitheater around the outside where you could sit and watch. Uh, that was what it was like. Where I'm standing right there was Herod's palace, the, the Roman puppet king of Israel. Uh, he had this beautiful palace by the sea. And behind where that photo's taken, there was this huge amphitheater where they did Greek plays and songs and all that kind of thing. There's Roman statues everywhere. There's classic looking Roman pillars everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, there were temples to Roman gods and to the emperor. It was Roman to the core. This Gentile area that was unlike the Jewish area surrounding it. And so no self-respecting Jew wanted to go to Caesarea because that's where the unclean Gentile dogs were. That's what they would call them. <laughs> the unclean Gentiles were there. And the Jews wanted to be separate. They wanted to be left alone to do their own things, not to defile themselves with these, these unclean Gentiles. And so that's where we pick up in, of all places, Caesarea to an unlikely person in the story. So Acts chapter 10, verse one, here's what it says. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household gave alms generously to the people and prayed continuously to God. Now that's kind of incredible. That's not what you would expect when you're introduced to this Roman centurion, this guy who was a leader of a hundred soldiers, right? This guy, you th if the, the stereotypical, you picture a Roman centurion, you're probably thinking of somebody who's kind of strict, maybe mean, maybe apathetic, maybe cruel even, <laughs> they're depicted in movies often. And here we have Cornelius, a God-fearing, Roman centurion who, who, who loved the God of Israel. Pretty wild. And he didn't just love him, like just thinking about him just intellectually, but he lived it out in his life, in his generosity, in his giving to the poor, in the way that he served others, and in his devotion to prayer. Praying continually uh, multiple times throughout the day. And where we see him next, he's in the middle of prayer. And this is what happens. This man of, uh, this Roman man of sincere faith. He says, it says this, about the ninth hour of the day, that's about 3 p.m., a common time for them to pray. He saw clearly in a vision, an angel of God came in, come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror. Now imagine you're praying and an angel just, Pff, Brandon, oh, you know, like I'd be terrified, wouldn't you? Like he's terrified. This angelic being just shows up and, he, and anytime an angel shows up in the Bible, everybody just drops in fear. It's pretty awesome. And so Cornelius, Cornelius is terrified and he says, what? He says, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who's called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among them, those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now, what's fascinating to me about this story is God is pleased with the generosity and the prayers of a Gentile. <gasps> like this, the Jewish audience in the first century would have been shocked right here, wouldn't they? <laughs> that, that God was pleased with a Roman centurion, the enemies of Israel. I mean, think about that, right? 
But yet this guy was devout in his faith, sincere in his faith, loved the Lord. He wasn't a full Jewish convert. We found out later in chapter 11, he wasn't fully Jewish convert. He wasn't into all the laws and, the, and all the ceremonial things. And he wasn't circumcised yet. It tells us that. Uh, so he wasn't a full convert. But this man was a sincere man of faith, really genuinely did love the Lord, even though he didn't get it all right. And so uh, this brings us then to scene number two. He sends his men, to, he does what the angel says. He sends his men to go find Peter in Joppa. And that's where we are in scene two. Scene two, we're in Joppa. So look at the map here. Okay, you can, it might be hard to see. Down there in the middle, uh, there's Joppa right there on the coast. Joppa uh, is called Jaffa today. It still exists. You can go visit it. You can go see it. And it's in modern day Tel Aviv. Uh, it's, it's a neighborhood in modern day Tel Aviv right on the coast. It's about 34 miles south of Caesarea. So to put that in perspective, that's like from here to Casa Grande. Okay. That's about the distance. So you can drive there in about an hour or so. You can walk there in about a day, maybe a day and a half, depending on how far you go or how the train was back then. And, uh, and that's where it was located. If, if that name sounds familiar, it may be because you've been around church a while and you maybe read the Bible before and, and uh, you've heard the story of Jonah. You know, the story of Jonah. God goes to Jonah and he, what does he tell Jonah to do? He says, I want you to go to the Gentile enemies of Israel and tell them the message for me and call them to repent. And the Ninevites, right? That's where he tells them to go to. And what does Jonah do? Jonah flees. He goes to Joppa and, and he gets on a boat to sail as far away as he can, the opposite direction down the Mediterranean, instead of going to where he was, God called him to go. And now here we are in Joppa and God's about to go to Peter. And he's going to tell him, I want you to go to the Gentile enemies of Israel and tell them this news. And Peter's going to have to decide, am I going to have a Jonah moment or am I going to obey God? It's kind of an interesting parallel. Same place. And so here we are, we're in Joppa and we're, we see Peter. And in verse nine, here's what happens. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. That's noon. And he, uh, it's lunchtime, right? And verse 10 says, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. That's fair. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So now think about this. Okay, I can't, I can't overstate how serious uh, Jewish culture was about their dietary laws and their restrictions. There were certain foods that were clean and then the other foods were unclean and they never ate the unclean foods. They only ate the clean foods, right? And so Peter being a, a devout Jewish man, when God lay, brings this vision of this sheet coming down from heaven, however that looked, right? Filled with all these different animals, some clean, some unclean. And he says, go ahead, eat them. Peter's thinking, this is a test, right? He's something like that, right? No way, Lord. I would never do that. I am a good Jewish man. I only eat the clean food. I would never eat unclean food. I have never eaten unclean food. No way. Can you imagine the situation? Yet God has a message he wants to get to Peter. God has something he's trying to show Peter here. And so God is persistent and he repeats himself. And anytime God repeats himself, it's like, pay attention. He really wants you to get this. So look at this, verse 15. And the voice came to him again, a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. And this happened three times. And the thing was taken up at once to heaven. And now while Peter was inwardly perplexed, as to what the vision that he had seen might mean. Now just imagine how perplexed Peter must have been. What in the world is going on? God is telling me to do something that my whole life I've considered a sin, that I've considered to be wrong, uh, that I would never have done. What does this mean? He's just beside himself, perplexed, pondering what it means. Then here's what happens. Behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And then verse 21 keeps going. Peter does what he was told. And Peter went down to the men and he said, I am the one you are looking for. For what is the reason for your coming? And they said, 
Cornelius, a centurion and upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. <gasps> Another shocking moment right there. Gentiles were not allowed to eat with Jews. Like the Jews did not eat with Gentiles, right? They didn't invite them into their house. They didn't share meals. And here Peter invites these guys into his house. It shows that something's happening with Peter. He's changing. He's doing something. Like everybody would have been shocked by that moment. You don't invite Gentiles into your house. What are you doing, Peter? Those unclean Gentiles? And then here's what happens. The next day he rose and he went away with them. And some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And later we find out it was six men from Joppa, Jewish men, go with Peter. And the reason that's important is because they're about to be witnesses along with Peter to something that God's about to do that's incredible that no one else would have believed. But thank goodness there's witnesses there to, 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 to back up the story. Uh, pretty crazy stuff. Peter knows that this is no coincidence, right? God's speaking to him about eating all this unclean food. And then all of a sudden, all these unclean Gentiles show up and they tell him that an angel came and he needs to go with them. This is a divine appointment. This is God moving, God using some, them to do something, something crazy. And Peter doesn't maybe know exactly what it is. And as he's wrestling and trying to figure out what it is that God's telling him, uh, his, his, his view of everything shifts and change. Peter really needed this moment because without it, I don't think he ever would have had a Gentile in his home. I don't know if he ever would have eaten with Gentiles. Uh, he, he, he definitely needed God to intervene and teach him a lesson here. So that brings us to the third scene. Peter goes with these guys to the Gentile area, to Caesarea, to meet with Cornelius. And that brings us back up to Caesarea. So scene three, we're back up in Caesarea now. And here's what happens. Verse 24. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. So imagine this guy, this prestigious centurion, sees an angel, tells everybody about it. He's well-respected. Everybody believing him shows up. They want to know what's going on. So he brings this crowd together. And then in verse 25, it says, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. There's a little sign that Cornelius didn't quite get it all the way, right? What are you doing? But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up. I too am a man just like you. And verse 27 says, and as he talked with them, he went in and he found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or with or visit anyone other of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. So here's Peter standing before all these Gentiles in their home, doing what no self-respecting Jew should be doing. They weren't, it was unlawful. It was wrong. They weren't supposed to associate and fraternize with all these Gentiles and share meals with them and all these things. And Peter says, God showed me that I shouldn't call people unclean that he can make clean. Now think about that. That's pretty awesome. Peter is saying uh, this revelation, this, this realization that he had, that it, it's, it's pretty clear when you look at the story of Jesus. Jesus even said, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law in Matthew 5, right? He says, I didn't come to do away with all the commands of the Old Testament. I fulfilled them. What does that mean? All these dietary laws, all these dietary restrictions, all these sacrificial laws that you read about in the Old Testament, why don't we all do them today as Christians? Because Jesus fulfilled them. So we don't sacrifice animals and goats anymore for the forgiveness of sins because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice once and for all. And we rest in his sacrifice. We don't have to follow all the dietary laws and all the dietary restrictions anymore because that was all about when God was saying, look, I have called you to be my people. If you read about it in Leviticus, right? I've called you to be my people, holy, set apart from all the other nations. I'm gonna have you be different from them. You're not gonna eat the same foods that they eat. You're not gonna worship the same gods that they worship. You're gonna be set apart. You're not gonna marry them because they're gonna to try to turn you to do things that they do. I want you holy. I want you set apart. I want you separated from them. Those things are unclean. You're going to live in a way that I was saying is clean. And that's what it was all about. So why are we not do, you know, following all those things anymore? Because it, after the cross, after Jesus, now Jesus has been that perfect sacrifice. We no longer have to do the, the, the ceremonial washings because we are perfectly washed in the blood of Christ. We no longer have to do the sacrifice because he's the perfect sacrifice, right? We can now be, those of us who are unclean can be made clean, Right? 
And so thank God, because I'm a Gentile, right? And many of us in this room are too. Those who were once considered unclean can now be made clean. Why? Because of Jesus. And that's what Peter is realizing here, that the good news of the gospel is not just for the Jews. It's also for the Gentiles, that all who are unclean can be made clean through the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. And so with this captive audience, every preacher's dream, <laughs> Peter, Peter tells them the gospel and he preaches a sermon and they're hanging on every word, right? Cornelius in the next few verses kind of tells them what happens. I'm going to skip over that and we'll jump to verse 34. This is what Peter says. So Peter opened his mouth and he said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord of it all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. And then it continues, it says, and we were our witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear not to all people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So Peter's saying, I was a witness. I had a meal with him. I saw him back from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one, who, he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. And to him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Amen. That's the gospel right there, right? Everyone who believes receives forgiveness in the name of Jesus. If you just believe in Christ, if you turn to him, everyone, not just the Jews, the Gentiles as well, not just the people who are like me, the, anyone in the world, no matter your culture, no matter your background, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what's happened to you or what's going on in your life, if you turn and you trust and you believe in Jesus Christ, you will be saved in his name. It's amazing. It's the greatest news of all time. It's not just good news for some, it's good news for all, all who believe. And then as these Gentiles hear this message and believe in Jesus, God does something undeniable, like an exclamation point to prove that, that he's, this is true, that he is saving the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Something shocking happens next. Verse 44. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. So this is like Acts chapter two all over again, except not to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. In verse 45, and, all, and he believes from among the circumcised, uh, and the believers from among the circumcised, so the Jewish guys who came with Peter, who would come with Peter, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. Shocking. Is this even allowed? The Gentiles can have the Holy Spirit too? They thought it was just for the Jews. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water from baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That was a shocking moment in the church. The first, you know, baptizing Gentiles, right? I, uh, the Jewish church would have been, what do we do with this? Is this even okay? Are we allowed to do this? But Peter says, these people have received the Holy Spirit just like we have. And what is baptism? It's, it's a symbolic act where it's a reminder, uh, just a ceremonial, a symbolic act of what Jesus has already done in you, that you've received the Holy Spirit, that you've received forgiveness of your sins and we're baptizing you and welcoming you in to the church as a member of the family of God. Uh, so this is an amazing moment, a turning point in the church. And here's the point, okay? It, it, the whole point of Acts chapter 10, why we're reading this whole long story is this. The gospel shatters prejudice. Think about that. The gospel shatters prejudice. How do I look down on somebody else and then beg God for mercy and forgiveness for me? How do I look at somebody else as unworthy and irredeemable when I am just as unworthy as they are? Because the gospel says that nobody is good enough, only Jesus is good enough. That nobody is worthy but Christ himself. And we are not saved by our worthiness, but by his worthiness. 
and his grace that he gives to us, right? It's amazing. We don't, we don't do anything to earn salvation. All we do is turn to Jesus, repent, and believe. We just trust in him, and he gives us his righteousness, as Bill preached about recently, right? And so the gospel, if you really think about it, it should change the way that we see other people. It should change the way that we look at other people because how do I hold all these other things so deeply against all these people who aren't like me when God has forgiven me of so many things myself? It should change the whole way that we look at everything. You know, this Gentile Cornelius who had uh, never been allowed into the inner temple courts is now welcomed into the family of God. Why? Because when Jesus died, you've heard the story, the temple veil was torn in two from top to bottom. And the temple of God was no longer in the temple, just in Israel, but it's in us, all who believe. The Holy Spirit now indwells us and we're all part of the family of God. And he welcomes us in. Christ tore that veil, that dividing wall, keeping out, all, uh, keeping out people and, and welcoming all who believe into his family. And so Peter was corrected in his thinking because he needed this. He was thinking the wrong way, looking down on these Gentiles. He was corrected of that. So the gospel shatters prejudice because Jesus saves all who believe. All who believe. There's no place for, for prejudice. Uh, it, it's, it's an ugly thing and absolutely no place in God's church. And I know it happens, right? We look down on other people because of the way they dress when they come here. Uh, you look down on other people because of the way they look, maybe, or because of the way they talk, or because of where they're from. No place for that. So my question for us is this, it's simply this. Who are you tempted to look at with prejudice? Who is it that you, you look at them and your, your blood begins to boil a little bit? Maybe you, see some, you have some contempt for them. You have a little bit of disgust. You're, you're angry, maybe, when you think about them. Where is it that maybe, search in your heart, Maybe there's somebody that you're tempted to look down on too. Like they are unworthy. Like they're irredeemable. Like God could never save them. We got we to gotta repent and turn that over to Christ. Uh, maybe it's by the way they look, like I was saying earlier. Maybe it's because they're too old. They're too young because of the color of their skin, because of the color of their hair, because of the color of their tattoos, because of, of whatever it is. We got to make sure we're not looking on people any less than Jesus sees them. Jesus cares about your heart. He doesn't care about the way you look on the outside. He's, he wants your heart. And we need to start looking at people that way. Maybe it's by their beliefs. This is a tough one. You look at somebody else, maybe because they made some choices that you don't agree with. And you're like, oh, they made all those choices. They're done. Write them off, right? Maybe you look at somebody by their beliefs. Maybe you look at somebody by their politics. <gasps> they got that flag. They've got that bumper sticker in there, you know? And you look at them like, God, just wipe them off the face of the earth so we can finally just fix this place, would you? You know? Been there, right? <laughs> it's really easy to look at other people that aren't like you with contempt, with, with, with prejudice, thinking they're irredeemable. God can never save those people. The world would be better without them. And realize that God can save anybody who turns to him. We can't be so quick to write people off. Maybe it's, up to, maybe it's on us to maybe go walk across that line, to, to break down that dividing wall, to, to welcome them with open arms and to call everybody to repent and trust in Jesus. Now, here's, here's the point. Here's what I need to make sure is very, very clear. We love people enough not to say, well, because you believe something different than me, well, I just go ahead and accept you no matter what. Like, I accept your beliefs and that's okay. Just believe whatever you want. I'll believe whatever I want and I'll just be happy. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. We love everybody to say that we call them to repent and believe in Jesus, but they're welcome here no matter what. Make sense? You're welcome no matter what you believe, but I'm going to call everybody to repent and trust in Jesus because the gospel in Christianity is the most inclusive and the most exclusive religion in the world. And here's what I mean by that. It's the most inclusive, meaning it, all are welcome. No matter your country, no matter your background, no matter your, where you're from, no matter what you've done in your life, no matter how horrible it might be, you are welcome at this church. And it's the most exclusive, meaning that, but Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. And we believe that firmly. And we're going to call all people to trust and believe in him. All are welcome and Jesus is the only way. And we're going to continue to call people to that. We're to stand firm on what's the truth. We love people enough to, to hold firm to the truth, but we love them enough to welcome them and, and help them to come along the way. And the last thing here is just maybe you're judging people by their status, by the, whether they're too rich or they're too poor or they, they're, they're not married or they are married. Or they've been married way too many times or they have no kids or they have too many kids or they, whatever, right? There's so many different ways we can look at somebody by their status, by their job, by their career, whatever, and we can look down on them. Let's, let's get rid of the prejudice in our hearts. Let's let God be the judge. 
And let's let the gospel shape the way we see other people, not with prejudice, not with the sinful human heart staining the way we look at other people, but through God's eyes, that every single person that we lock eyes with is created in the image of God and, and they can be saved if they would just turn to Jesus. And they're worthy of us making the effort to call them and to tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ and to welcome them with open arms, even if they aren't like me and you. So the gospel shatters prejudice, prejudice because Jesus saves all who believe. So here's just my challenge for you today. If you're a Christian, is there prejudice in your heart? Pray and, and, and genuinely seek God and say, God, is there something that's going on in here that, that, that I need to deal with? And ask God to forgive you, turn it over to him and ask him to help you see those people through his eyes and not through the eyes of the way that you've been raised or the way that you've always seen these people. And if you're not a Christian today, the message for you is simply, this is the good news, that Jesus saves all who believe. And if you would turn to Jesus today, he can save you too. No matter what you've done, no matter what's happened, no matter where you're from, even if you don't look like anybody else in this church, you're welcome here. And we're just going to love you and call you to believe in Jesus. And if you do, we will welcome you with open arms into this family. May today be the day that you turn your life to him. Hey, thanks again for watching. To see Pastor Brandon talk about the importance of loving God's word, watch this video next. Also, make sure you do all of those YouTube things to be sure that you never miss a video and help us reach more people. If you're in the Phoenix area, stop by and see us in person. We'd love to have you join us, and we'll see you next week.